Hey, Dr. Bernard here. I'm not here to scare you about food trucks with this video. Sometimes we like to joke that the sketchier the place, the more likely the food is to be really good. If you see an unmarked food truck in the back alleyway by a dumpster with an operator who's been seen to scratch between his legs and then touch the food, you're free to do whatever you like to do, but that's a little too sketchy for me. Luckily, most trucks here in the United States are not like that. A man ate pork tacos from an illegal food truck. This is how his brain shut down. CD is a 47-year-old man presenting to the emergency room confused with a massive headache. His wife Natalie tells the admitting nurse that she found him collapsed on the floor, shaking with his eyes rolling into the back of his head. Several months earlier, behind his office building, CD saw a food truck that he had never seen before. He had heard some stories about a mustached man operating the truck, dropping by at random places in this small town to sell food so delicious that most people had never tasted anything like it before. CD thought this was kind of sketchy, a blank, unmarked truck parked in the back alleyway, but he saw the mustache man and knew that this is obviously the perfect setting to enjoy the tastiest food. At the truck now, CD decided to order some pork tacos on recommendation from the chef. At first, CD thought that the meat felt maybe a little too tender in his mouth, almost as if parts of it were like chewing the inside of his own cheeks, maybe cooked medium rare. This was also the first time that he had pork anything, except for maybe some bacon since he was a kid, so he didn't quite remember exactly what the experience was like. The flavor was bold and unbelievably delicious almost like it was made of something that wasn't allowed in this country. Immediately after finishing the tacos, CD felt good. He was okay for the rest of the day. As he was walking to his car on his way out of work, he thought he felt something weird in his stomach. It didn't last very long, so he didn't think too much of it. As the days passed, CD would feel kind of strange at random times. Some weeks, he'd have a cough that just wouldn't seem to go away. These would come with itchy and watery eyes and a low-grade fever. These could be allergies, but he didn't know for sure. One day, a couple months after eating those tacos, CD used the bathroom. He looked back in the toilet and thought that he saw some rectangular fragments floating around in the bowl, emanating from the mass. He hadn't seen these before. He thought they kind of looked like pieces of canned tuna floating around, but he hadn't eaten any canned tuna recently. He told his wife about this, but he wasn't going to show her his stool, so maybe he was just seeing things, he thought. At a regular health checkup, CD asked about his low-grade fever, about his cough, and about some strange headaches that he would get sometimes. He also asked about the tuna pieces that appeared in his stool. The physician, after doing some tests, told CD that this was probably allergies. It was springtime anyways, and so he recommended some over-the-counter medicines to help with this, as well as recommend CD to chew his food more often. This would be better overall for his health and he was on his way. CD started hearing rumors about how the food truck may have been an unlawful business, mostly because their small town had never seen anything like it. The mustache man didn't seem like he was from around the town, and it was rare here to have visitors, but other people said that the man didn't have permission from the county or the state or any other authority in this area to operate a truck like this. Some of CD's co-workers reported random bouts of not feeling well after eating at the truck. One even reported that she saw the man scratch between his legs and then touch the food right after, taking a small sample for himself. But CD didn't care. He remembered how delicious those tacos were. Months later, he came across the truck again, got the tacos again, and his mind was blown at how good they were. But a couple days later, CD thought he felt strange and he didn't know why. It was a little bit of a cough, maybe like a fever. When he stood up from his chair, he felt like his stomach was getting pulled into the ground and heat would radiate out of his neck. But this was short-lived. Over the next several months, CD started feeling a constant throbbing sensation in his head that started happening every day. It felt like his head was heavy. One day it hurt so bad it brought him down to the ground and he emptied his stomach from both ends and afterwards he felt even worse. In the other room, CD's wife, Natalie, hears the commotion, and as she walks in, she sees her husband on the floor, shaking with his eyes rolling into the back of his head as she calls for 911, and he's brought to the emergency room, where we are now. 
At examination, the medical team sees CD have a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, the kind where one shakes and convulses. Typically, these only last a few moments, but in CD, it wouldn't stop until the pharmacist gave medicine to terminate it. His blood pressure was high, his heart rate was high, his eyes were wide open, but he was unresponsive. And this gives the medical team some clues as to what's happening. CD's wife started talking about the headaches that he had been experiencing over the last several months. Taking over-the-counter medicines sometimes didn't help. Both the seizures happening now and the headache developing over time means that something has been happening to his brain, but what could it be? CD didn't have any recent insomnia, which could suggest a psychiatric problem, or something like a nutritional deficiency or a tumor. He didn't have any recent personality changes, and he didn't have any sudden neck stiffness either, which could mean meningitis. A blood test finds that CD has leukocytosis. Luke from Greek leukos, meaning white, cyte referring to cell, and osis meaning a disorder of. White blood cell disorder, and in this case meaning that there's more white blood cells floating around than normal. This could be because CD might have a brain infection, but having just had a seizure, adrenaline was getting released into his body, causing white blood cells that typically stick to the lining of the blood vessels to detach, maybe causing that leukocytosis and meaning that meningitis would be unlikely. But what wouldn't be out of the question is maybe some other kind of infection. CD told his wife about the pork tacos from the food truck, but he didn't tell her about some of the other details about that truck. That some of his co-workers had recently gotten sick after eating there. That he found the unmarked truck hidden in the back alleyway. He told her about the weird tuna fish-like appearance in his stool. She tells the medical team about this, and it gives them a more clear idea of what's happening. Pigs and humans have lived together throughout much of history. This proximity has made for some special developments. Human stomachs are a definitive host for a tapeworm called Tinea solium. The worms have a scolex that attaches to our intestines, and they survive and feed off of our diet while growing to be 20 to 40 feet long. As time passes, their segments break off and appear in the person's stool. Some of these segments contain eggs, and they're called gravid proglottids. Remnants of this contaminated human waste can get into pig's food supply. Pig's stomach is similar to human stomach. Inside the pig, Tinea solium oncospheres hatch and penetrate the intestinal wall, circulating into muscle tissue. And when we eat meat, we're eating muscle. This is where the exposure and then the infection happens. As the medical team takes a stool sample from CD, they confirm he has Tinea solium tapeworm segments in there. It wasn't canned tuna that he saw that day, it was pork tapeworm. And if he usually never ate pork except for those two times at the unmarked food truck, then how did this happen? In the United States, agricultural policy, standards, and enforcement has helped prevent Tinea solium from infecting pigs. Sanitation, hygiene standards, and slaughterhouse inspection have made it so that anyone living in the United States buying USDA-inspected pork shouldn't come into contact with Tinea solium. A different species of Tinea, called Tinea saginata, is known as beef tapeworm, comes from cows, different because of how cow stomachs are different from humans and pigs. This is something that you're also not going to find with legal foods. Food trucks in the United States overwhelmingly are fine and not at all like this. The tinea that CD has is tinea solium, specifically from undercooked pork. Cooking it well helps against infection, and CD is a person who doesn't eat pork except for those two specific times. In his workplace, another coworker who had eaten food from the same truck had also reported similar symptoms, reported what looked like canned tuna pieces inside their stool after feeling a low-grade fever over the span of several weeks, but this still doesn't explain CD's seizures. A brain MRI for CD reveals multiple lesions representing viable cysts. The tinea solium parasite wasn't just in his gut, but multiple oncospheres had lodged into his brain and had been living there for at least the last several months. They passed through his stomach wall, got into small blood vessels, and crossed his blood-brain barrier, causing neurocysticercosis. Multiple cysts were found at different stages of disease. When the larvae cross into the brain, they're small. They evade the immune system. At this vesicular stage, they make the brain look like it has holes everywhere. But as time passes, these cysts start to change. As the larvae start to degenerate and shrink, the immune system starts to react. Cysts enter the colloidal vesicular stage, and the brain starts to swell from the extra immune response. The brain keeps expanding inside a closed space, the skull, but those cysts aren't going anywhere. 
then the cysts continue to degenerate. At first, they're still active in the granular nodular stage, but eventually they become mineralized and inactive with no swelling nearby. But this nodular calcified stage can cause recurrent seizures due to the fact that a calcified dead parasite is lodged in and stuck in the brain. The tinea solium worm in the gut is from eating pork meat that has the oncospheres. Just eating pork doesn't give brain cysts. The pigs were infected by eating human waste that has the tinea eggs and gravid proglottids. When the undercooked, infected pork meat is consumed, that part of the life cycle causes the tapeworm in humans, but brain cysts come from a slight deviation in the life cycle, where humans come into contact with food that may have been in indirect contact with human waste. So rather than the pigs eating the oncospheres, humans eat them directly. This parasite would have migrated in pigs to pig muscle instead, in humans, it migrates to the brain. The owner-operator of this suspicious food truck had pork tapeworm himself. When he prepared CD's pork tacos, which he undercooked, hands that touched the parts of the body containing tinea eggs touched the food that ended up in CD's stomach. It's not enough that CD just ate undercooked pork that had tinea oncospheres from the pigs, but his brain infection was coming from consuming tinea eggs directly as if he were the pig, meaning that CD was infected twice by different forms of the same tapeworm. This is an important point. The intestinal tapeworm version of Tinea solium is from eating undercooked pig meat. The brain infection neurocysticercosis is from eating parasite eggs from a human who has the intestinal tapeworm. That is, somehow you are coming into indirect contact with their feces and ingesting it, or they touched around their butt where tinea eggs can be found sometimes, and they touched something that you happen to touch, and then you make contact hand to mouth. And knowing that this happens, it should make sense as to why some traditions discourage the consumption of pork if it's not for other reasons as well. This isn't uncommon. Around the world, neurocysticercosis is a common cause of seizures. In some countries around the world, people get infected because they live in a household where someone has a tinea tapeworm infection. The infected person might use the bathroom, they'll wipe, or do whichever hygienic ritual that they'll normally conduct post-bowel movement, and they may not have washed off the tinea eggs on their hands. They touch food eaten by others in the same house, infecting them. The oncospheres absorb into the gut. They don't form tapeworms in this case, they float around in the blood, sometimes crossing the blood-brain barrier and embed in. Over months to years, they form calcified masses in the brain, and because you can't just easily go into the brain and cut out whatever parts that you want to, these aren't easy to remove. At best, they don't cause any problems, and people don't even know that they have it. But at worst, they get into the other parts of the brain. They can get into the eyes, they can get into the spinal cord, the subarachnoid space, and they can also cause seizures, sometimes refractory, to treatment. All of this bringing us to the final point. USDA inspected pork isn't going to have this, so where did the truck get their meat? Well, it's been documented that there exists an issue whereby contraband meat is smuggled into this country through various routes. Sometimes you can find these unlawful products for sale, no further than listings on local websites and on social media. These are meat products that are banned likely for the reason of possibly spreading disease to humans and farm animals in this realm. And while we may never know where the mustache man really got his pork from, we know CD is a person whose only time eating pork was allegedly from the truck, and others got sick from this truck. In this case, we go with what the patient says. His wife didn't appear to have the tapeworm, and because the truck was mobile, operating in a small town that maybe hasn't had a need to handle food trucks, then we have a good guess as to where CD's problem came from. Food trucks are almost never like this. If you're in an outdoor event in warm weather in the United States, it's typically full of trucks. Every which one has been vetted, probably inspected more often than most restaurants. The mobile medium allows the seller to set up shop quickly, make some sales, and then they could disappear quickly, potentially without any accountability, should something go wrong. That's why some places are super strict, maybe a little too strict on food trucks, but the mobility of the truck is what sets it apart from a stationary restaurant. Extra moving parts are always added, possible points of malfunction. 
As the medical team evaluates CD's situation, they start him on two antiparasitic medicines for both the worms in his gut and the cysts in his brain. One medicine, Praziquantil, forces calcium to enter into the worm to force its muscles to contract, paralyzing it and getting its suckers to detach and to dislodge. The other medicine, Albendazole, destabilizes the parasite and begins to starve it, depleting its energy. When the parasites start reacting to the therapy, it can trigger an immune response. Because we're dealing with neurologic tissue, CD was started on corticosteroids to limit that inflammatory response. He was also started on anti-seizure medicine to prevent another seizure from happening again. As CD was observed in the hospital for a few more days, he no longer had any more seizures and his neurologic exam appeared to be normal. Everything else with his brain appeared to be okay, and when he was discharged to go home for several months after, he was noted to no longer have seizures anymore, as it appeared that he made a full recovery. Thanks to Angie Berger for letting us film at her truck. Her burgers are delicious. If you get a chance, try them. Thanks so much for watching. Take care of yourself, and be well.